In episode 100 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast, I have a conversation with Mark Dawson. Mark Dawson is an internationally best-selling thriller author from the UK, earning a hearty seven figures from selling his ebooks around the globe. Now, we talk about his publishing journey through traditional publishing as well as indie publishing but most remarkably, and this is what I'm really excited about, is we talk about the groundbreaking deal that he just signed with Welbeck Publishing, which is a print-only deal, but not just a print-only deal. It's a deal that demonstrates the true partnership and collaboration that can happen when a very successful indie author and a very forward-thinking person with traditional publishing experience come together. This is truly groundbreaking, truly amazing, and a great and inspiring interview with Mark Dawson. Hey Mark, thank you so much for joining me here today. Pleasure to be here. So I wanna go back to the beginning because there may actually be some people who haven't heard of you yet. I know it's kind of a, a weird thing, but there are you know lots of people in the world and may, maybe not all of them are big fans of Mark Dawson the way I am. Um, you were not a writer originally. Um, you were a legal professional. You were a lawyer. I was, yes. So I, I qualified. I did law at university, and then um, I did a, a law degree, um, and then I kind of it just pushed me into the path of, of being a lawyer. So I, I was uh, I practiced in London for about five or six years at a couple of different firms, and. Um, I don't really regret it. It's given me lots of useful skills, but I wasn't a very good lawyer. Um, and you know, I could very easily have plodded on. It's quite well paid, all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't, it wasn't making me happy. Um, so I was quite pleased to be able to to get out and do something else. Okay. And now, I know you had, before you became the Mark Dawson that I know and love, uh, you had started uh, by uh, wanting to write and publishing some work. You did that. Uh, how did you do it the first time around? Yeah, so I, back into what ninety nine two thousand, I um, a friend at the law school, actually no, the law firm came in and said that I've just finished a novel, and would I? And he asked me if I'd read it, so I did, and it wasn't the best thing I'd ever read, um, but he had actually finished a sixty five thousand word novel, so that was impressive, and it was I think I'd always been thinking it would be quite cool to write something, and and that was the um, kick in the pants I needed to actually get down and, and, and do one. So I, I finished, um, I think, three short stories, I think it was, um, one of which involved Hiroshima um, and one of which involved a rock and roll band and then, and then one other. And I sent them to um, to an agent um, and she wrote back and said, um, cause I think I'd lied a bit and said, like, I've got three novels and, and here, are, here are some selections. And she picked the one with the rock and roll band and said, like, I really love this. I'd love to take you on, but can I see the rest of it? Um, and I had three, well, I basically had to put her off for three months whilst I finished it, which it was, I had a lot of, I <laughs> still had a lot to do. So um, I finished that. Um, she then um, sold it very quickly. Um, so it was all very fast and surprisingly fast. And I was published by Pan Macmillan in the UK and I think in Russia, weirdly enough, um, in translation, uh, around about the turn of the century, a couple of books. Uh, the first one's called The Art of Falling Apart, and the second one is called Subpoena Colada, um, and they were okay. both um, they were both published. All righty, and so uh, those came out in what, early 2000s? Is that when they, when the book? Uh... Yeah, I think 2000, 2001, 2002, that kind of, that kind of time. Okay, and, and what was that experience like for you? I mean, that was your first experience. You found an agent right away, which is quite astonishing, actually. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised. I wasn't expecting it to be as simple as that, but I, I sent it to three agents, I think, um, that I'd picked out the artist's and writer's yearbook, and two of them came back and said they'd like to represent me, which so I was kind of thinking this was supposed to be hard, and it was, and I don't think they're particularly good books either, so I, I think I just got a bit lucky. Um, and then I was, again, expecting the publication process to be difficult, and that was simple. I mean, the first one or two rounds produced people who wanted to publish it and Macmillan obviously a, a, a well-known um, trade house um, very happy to to work with them and the editor was great um, but it was it was not I didn't think the high point was I enjoyed going to the parties and and the editorial process was fun for someone you know who was thinking this was something I'd like to do for a career um, it was great to get involved with that but the it reached a 
this was an apogee when uh, I saw my books on the shelf when they came out. Um, and then I say this all the time, but it, it, it was it was at once a high point and then the start of a decline because they weren't they weren't at eye level. They weren't you know you worked in bookshops you know you know the prime real estate is kind of eye level, right. um, face out. Um, mine were were shoe level, spine out. Um, so I I rearranged the shelves. Um, obviously, as all good writers are <laughs> wanting to do. And then the next day, uh, the, the uh, staff doing their jobs properly had rearranged them back again. Um, and and that was that was that. Really, I didn't see anyone buying. I I'd hang around the shelves hoping that someone would pick the book up. And I could see them go and take it to the to the checkout and and, and buy it. I never saw that. I never saw anyone read read them on the tube or on a bus or anything like that. And they didn't earn out. Um, they they um, both of them got decent advances, but they didn't sell enough to to earn that advance back. And you know, two strikes. They weren't prepared to give me a third strike, and that was that. So I I stopped writing for about seven years after after that. Oh, uh, what I love about what you just shared with me, and, and we've never talked about this, so this is actually very fascinating to me, is the the foreshadowing. Of, of, of this, which we're going to get to. I'm just teasing the listeners. Mm -hmm. So uh, six, seven years passed. Where did John Milton come from? Because that's, that's the first big character that, that you're known for. Yeah, so I, I, I wrote a couple of um, my kind of entrees to indie publishing were a couple of um, thrillers set in London during the Blitz um, and just after the Blitz. So I enjoyed writing those. It took quite a long time. Uh, by my standards these days, you know, maybe two or like three or four years for the two books and I'd, I'd be um, writing a bit faster than that these days um you know they didn't they I think they're pretty good books I'm I'm still proud of them but they didn't sell very strongly because I didn't really know what I was doing um and Milton came along and here it's there, there's Milton there um Milton came along um because I've I had an idea of kicking around in my head for ages um of uh, a character like an a, a contemporary updating of the equalizer so not the denzel washington version the edward woodward version from the 80s oh yes i think it was on cbs in the state um yes. i i love that and um i wanted to update that so and i thought i could do that and the other benefit of writing milton or, or a, a series with the character who is a bit of a ronin going from place to place solving problems was because once his character was built and and the world that he lived in was was built subsequent books would be easy to write because I wouldn't have to completely reinvent the wheel every time I started a new book. I would grow to know him as a character, and yeah, which has happened. And um, you know, in terms of inspiration and ideas, I can think of, you know, just read the newspapers and where would I like him to go? And so that was, that was pretty simple. Um, and also the, the research was much less. So I didn't have to go to the National Archive in Kew to look at old case files. I didn't have to go to the um, the newspaper archive in Collendale in North London and look through the, get the microfiches out and put them in the microfiche readers. And I still smell that, the smell of burning plastics there after, you know, spending a lot of time in there. So it was all kind of Googleable and could be done from my desk or occasionally I, I might take a trip, but it was all pretty easy to, to get that together quickly. So when did that, when did this indie journey of yours start then? Um, I think the the first book was called The Black Mile, the first non-Milton book, and that was, I think, either 2011 or 2012. I could probably sit down and work it out, but it was around about that time. And then um, Milton came along, I think it was probably 2013, either back end of 2012, I started 2013. And, you know, since then, I mean, there's 15 books in the Milton series now. I've spun off two characters, Beatrix and Isabella Rose, so um, five in, I think, maybe six books in each each of those series now. So plus some other bits and bobs that I've written in, in the margins and you know, probably, you know, got over 30 books now, nearer 35 books published since I started indie publishing about what, eight years ago. So at what point, because I know that you're very analytical, you love to look at numbers, you love to measure. At what point did you sit back and look at the numbers and say, wait a minute, this is something. Um, I can remember there's a few milestones. I remember the, the first, check from Amazon I was paid by checking those is for like 12 bucks um which was quite weird given that usually I'm giving Bezos money and now he's sending me so that, that was that was unusual then um after that I mean the, the first time I figured out Facebook um advertising I was saying to my accountant like I've just spent ten dollars and I've made forty dollars and I wanted him to check my maths because I, I I'm not you know I, I like numbers but I'm not saying I'm any kind of 
guru or ninja when it comes to maths. And, and he was he was like, yep, you've basically found uh, the, the best ATM in the world. You know, can I invest in your business, please? Um, but then the, the first time I thought maybe he had a maid or at least I was on the way to doing it was um, start of 2014. My wife was on maternity leave um, and I was still working. So I was commuting from Salisbury to London and back every day. So it's three hours on the train. And in January of 2014, um, I was working um, in the film industry and I, for the first time, matched the uh, amount that I was taking home from my day job with the amount that I was taking home from um, my writing. And I said to my wife, my wife's much more ballsy than me, and, and, and she was like, you should, you should probably quit. You can do this full time now. And because I'm more cautious and because she was on maternity leave and I didn't want to take too many, I want to gamble too much. I said that if I can match this, for the for a year if i can match my day job salary for a year then i think i'll feel comfortable that i can i can leave and um the next month i doubled it and the next month after that i doubled it and and by the time i left i was probably earning five or six times what i was taking from my my day job and um you know it, i figured out by that stage that I, it was more expensive for me not to quit um, than <laughs> well, you to had- quit yeah, you had matched the the money before you got to the end of the year, so you're like, okay, I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, also, I mean, obviously, my day job technically, I was supposed to work from nine to five for them, um, and they were paying me X. And in in the kind of the spare time, so the three hours on the train I had, I was making X times seven, probably. So it, it was by that stage, if you worked out how much my the hours in my day could generate, I could generate much more by writing than I could by watching movies. Um, so that was it was pretty simple at that stage. I, I, I couldn't really, it would be irresponsible not to have quit. Okay. Uh, and, that, and that's fantastic. And I remember kind of, you know, being there and watching, watching your rise um, on, on the different platforms, it, but it wasn't enough uh, that you were successful as an independent author. It was a case where you saw something and saw a way that you could help other writers. So, how did the you know the self publishing uh, podcast or uh, back in the day the self publishing formula? How did how did that whole aspect uh, come about? Um, well, I I'm quite competitive and I don't like um, people. Well, I, I like to match myself with other people. And anyway, so Nick Stevenson, who's a friend, uh, had had his his first course, and he you know, it's a good course. And Nick gave me an idea of how much he'd made on that first launch. And I thought, well, I can probably, I can, I know I've sold more books than Nick has. Um, and I want, he's a good teacher. I wonder if I could do that too. So, um, so I got in touch with James and John who I, I work with in SPF and, um, we put the first advertising for authors or Facebook ads for authors as, as it was back in those days. Cause as you know, I was one of the first authors to crack the Facebook advertising code um and so we, we put that course together and we released it and um we did we did do better um and you know and since then we've we've released our courses um it's two courses now and they're each released twice a year so four launches uh, throughout the year of the two courses and you know since then i think we've we've taught more than certainly more than ten thousand students now across all those those courses you know, we've got a, a great Facebook group that we like doing the podcast. We give away a lot of free stuff. We've got a conference next year, which is effectively, we'll be losing a bit of money on that, but it's going to be a load of fun to do it. So, um, you know, it's, it is nice to be able to give a little back. And, and also, you know, we, we were at Nick, Nick together and um, I, I don't know, maybe half a dozen people came up to me and said that I, they'd either retired themselves to write or they'd retired their husbands, which is a nice new development. We're starting to see couples working together. And, and, you know, pointing to the moment they figured out how to advertise. And, and, you know, I'd like to think I gave them some clues along that path. And, um, yeah, that's, it's pretty, it's pretty tough to beat that kind of um, feeling when someone says that you've changed their lives. And, and you know, I, I, I probably don't change lives with my books, but it is possible to change lives when you're teaching authors how to make a living with their books. And, and that's, that's always been just, we, we love that kind of uh, feedback. So now that, now that you have that, how do you, and you're still producing, um, you know, novels. Um, um, how do, how do you balance your time uh, with the creative Mark Dawson, who's creating the thrillers and the Mark Dawson, who is the, uh, the teacher, the instructor, the mentor, helping other writers. Cloning helps. Um, that, that's been, uh, that's been tremendously helpful. Um, yeah, it's, 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 
it's a challenge, a daily challenge. We were thinking there's other things we're going on, going on as well that we, you know probably won't mention tonight. But it, there is there's loads of stuff on my plate. Um, so for the book side of things, which would be the thing that I would choose if I had to choose between the two, I would I would write. Um, that's just me, really. There isn't anybody else. My brother is helping me with a little with the bits and bobs around the corners now, and I'd like to bring him on a bit more. But apart from that, there isn't anybody else. Um, yeah, you know, obviously I've got you know Stuart Bache does my covers. I've got an editorial set up now. You know, there's, there are contractors that I can reach out to, but it is basically just me. Um, with SPF, um, there's probably I'm going to say ten of us now. I and mean, there's me, James, and John. Tom, young Tom, is a full time employee of the company. Uh, we've got three or four, maybe five um, VAs around the world to help with us at different time zones. So you know, SPF is supporting you know, probably 10, 10 people now, um, which is, is great. But if we didn't have that kind of network around me, it wouldn't be possible. Um, and James is very good. James knows to shield me from as much stuff as possible. And that's not, that's not to say that I'm not approachable because I try to be, but I don't have to answer every email. Um, and you know, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of people who would, you know, w would take advantage of my time and James, and John as well, but James especially is very good at making sure that um, he steps in and, and filters things to me if they need to come to me. Right. I think, I mean, it's critical to uh, to protect that creative, that IP that uh, that started it all, right? Yeah. And as, as James says, my my main job in the company is, I mean, I'm kind of, I suppose I'm the CEO and without getting to on my own ass, the kind of the, the visionary and the strategist, but my main job is to be a best-selling author because... You know, it's, I've said this in our group, it, and, you know, you see it all the time. Whenever there's a gold rush, usually the people who make the most money are the people selling shovels and picks. <laughs> um, and we, we see that in the indie space. Um, I'm seeing it more with people coming along with no real track record who will promise to teach people how to do something that they can't do. Right. Um, so, you know, my first, my first piece of advice when people are asking me about a service provider or, you know, a piece of software or a course is to, is to, can they walk the walk and talk the talk? That, that's, that's the thing you need to look at. What the Amazon rankings like are the telephone numbers. If they are, why are they going to teach you that? Why aren't they doing it themselves? Um, so yeah, that's fairly, that's common sense. But my, my main job is when people um, look to take one of our courses, they can look me up on Amazon. And I think I'm the fourth highest action and adventure writer at the moment in, in the States, which is, so I'm obviously I'm selling books. <laughs> um, so hopefully provided I, I can, you know, teach a little bit and maybe I can, I can show people what, what I do. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and the thing that uh, boggles my mind is uh, knowing so many hugely successful authors like yourself who are, you know, easily in the, in the seven figures of, of the income that they make from their, from their writing is even though you have fans around the world, you know, you put out a new release and you're getting downloads in dozens of countries immediately and you have people just waiting for that next book that you write there's still an element of discoverability that comes from the fact that, you know, in, in, in many estimates between 20 and 30% of readers are actually reading eBooks because print is still dominant in our industry, which is why mm -hmm. we all think that traditional publishers have their heads up their butts. It's because they're focusing on a different element, but you have just done something that I've been waiting years for. I've been waiting for this moment and, and I, and I, I got to congratulate you in person at Nink last week, but you just signed a groundbreaking deal that I think is going to change the face of publishing in general for indies and traditional publishers. Can, can we please talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. So it is really cool. And not, I don't, I, I kind of posted it in, in the SPF group and I don't know that everyone really got it, um, which you yeah. know, people were saying I'm selling out, which is clearly not the case. Not um, at all. No. So yeah, you're you're right. So the, this is kind of the holy grail for me, and has been for a little while. Is is that I'm you know I can I'm pretty good at selling eBooks, to the extent that it would take a stupendous deal for me to sell a publisher to license the eBook rights to, to any of my books, um, because without bigging myself up too much, I think I can sell those those rights better than they can. Um, so why would I sell? Why would I give them away unless they're going to park a Brinks truck? Um, at the bottom of my drive and, and tip lots of money in, onto, my, onto my property. So um, that's not going to happen. So what I've been trying to do for ages um, is to negotiate a deal whereby um, I would take the, the step up a bit, step back a bit. So if you think about a book um, as, as an asset, so once you've written it, you, you become 
less creatively attached to it. And what you should be looking at is now you, it's, it's something to monetize. So it's a, it's an ASIN or a SKU, you know, that's what it's a widget effectively. So we're looking to sell the various permutations of that widget. So we make as much money as we can. So there's obviously there's digital rights, there's uh, audiobook rights, there's film and TV, there's translation um, rights, audio translations. There's, there's lots of ways that we can, we can sweat that asset. And the biggest, um, most of those I can do myself. Um, the biggest one, as you as you said, the seventy percent of the market is print, and print is very difficult for indies to to do ourselves. And I had started to look at whether we could get into that. Um, so my brother um, went to Clay's, which is a, a big um, a printing house in the UK. They do the Harry Potter books, and you know all the you know, they did um, Margaret Atwood. Or, you know, they, they do all the all the big releases. And we got some numbers for a, a print run, two or 3,000 copies of the first book in the series. Um, we also, through the SPF community, um, had a way into Waterstone, so one of the big uh, retailers in, in the UK. And um, we thought there's a good chance that we could get those books onto the shelves of Waterstones in the north of England, in Scotland. And that would give us a, a, a use case to demonstrate to Waterstones more generally that these books would sell. Um, so we'd started to look at that. Um, in the meantime, in fact, slightly before then, my agent had gone out to Morocco for a birthday party, and she was at dinner. She was sitting next to someone she's, she's know, she knows, a guy called Mark Smith, who um, is not Aussie. He came to the UK, I'm guessing, 20 years ago, got into publishing. He's an entrepreneur, I think. He's very entrepreneurial, uh, but he got into publishing and established... Um, now, which was his first... I think it was um, Quercus was the first um, imprint that he established, and... Um, with that, um, bought the rights to Stieg Larsson, uh, the, the Millennium Trilogy. He published those for the first time in the UK um, and lots of other big hits after that. He then moved to Bonnier, um, Zafra Books, uh, set up another imprint there. And um, whilst at Bonnier, they bought Wilbur Smith in an eight-figure deal. They bought Linda the Plant. So they're acquiring at a fast rate. And he was... he. My, my agent, Annabelle, gave him uh, the first Milton book and he read all of them very quickly. He read all 50, which happens quite often, which is, is lovely. I get emails from like that quite a lot, which is, is great to hear. And Mark read them, he loved them, he wanted to work with me. So we started talking about the kind of parameters of a deal. Originally, he was interested in taking all the rights, and I was, also I was very flattered by that, but I was not interested because um, I don't want to give away rights that I can sell. Um, so we, I said, look, how about a print-only deal? Because uh, Hugh Howey, well-known five or even six years ago now, did a, a print-only deal for, for Wool. Um, I think Bella Andre may have done um, something similar for, for her romances. Yes, so did. it's been done. Um, and one of those really frustrating things is that it, it, it should be a no-brainer. So you've got these properties, um, which are dem they can be demonstrated to sell at high volumes. They get great reviews. Readers love them. Why wouldn't they love them in print as much as they love them in digital? It made absolutely no sense to me why um, we hadn't seen a flood of these deals. But I think there are reasons. Mark, think, you know, we haven't chatted about that, but he thinks there are reasons why this hasn't happened. But he, he was, bless him, prepared to take a chance. Um, he left Bonnier, unfortunately. Just we, we negotiated the deal. Before we could sign it, he left. Um, so we were like, that's a pain. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, we kind of lost contact for about a year. And then at London Book Fair last year, um, I bumped into him um, on the stand. And um, he said, uh, Don't, I can't tell you too much, but something new is happening. And I'd like to pick up that conversation again with you once, once that's happened in a month's time. Um, he then went to my agent and he and um, another, another entrepreneur with some funding had bought um, a... Carlton Books with, with lots of different imprints in the UK. So they bought this, this established publisher um, and have set up um, a, a number of new imprints, including one called Welbeck. Um, I, I don't know if that's the one that I come out under. But they, um, their first acquisition um, were the print rights to the Milton Books. Um, so we have a joint venture. So I, I put in the um, intellectual property. They put in the funding for print, distribution, warehousing, all their contacts. We'll do editing, new covers possibly, um, and those those books will come out the, f the three next year, three the year after that, three the year after that, and basically three a year until 2025. Um, so we are excited. It's going to be fun. And so what I think I like about this is uh, I think the terms of the deal, as I understand them, are 
everyone makes money rather than uh, in previous deals, there has been a huge advance, one that is very rare for a publisher to make back. Therefore, it's like a one done deal. And then, and then the publisher goes, oh, no, that was a dumb idea. I shouldn't have done that. This isn't the case. In, in this case, it's not that at all, as I understand it. No, it's a joint venture. So there is, we, we, there's no advance. Um, so it's, they don't have to take a big risk, although they are, they are taking the risk in that they, they are funding the, the, you know, the cost of the operation. So the capital right. requirement, they're meeting that. I'm not putting any money in. I'm putting in the IP, which is, right. you know, is a valuable, that's the valuable asset that I can contribute to the pie or the pots. Um, they can contribute cash and expertise and contacts. And so between the two of those, and obviously I can help them with marketing. So I've, as a part of the deal, I, I will be working with them once or twice a month to, so they can tap the digital marketing expertise that I've built up over the last five, six years. So it's, it's a, you know, it's, it should be one of those deals where we, everyone wins. It's very equitable. Um, you know, that they're not, looking to recoup a huge advance as you say it's, it's not like that at all it, it is just a, a deal whereby we benefit equally assuming that these books sell and right. you know who knows they, maybe they won't um maybe they will so but it seems we'll, to we'll have see. adapted the best of both worlds right so you have a much faster release strategy because typically in traditional publishing it's one book a year but you're already starting off with three so looking mm. at fulfilling a need and then fulfilling it fast Right, I'm yeah, much and, faster. And, and, and physical, right? There's distribution. This, this isn't just, hey, it's print on demand. It's sitting on a website waiting for someone to go to Amazon. And, or no, they're, no. they're going to be able to find this book, maybe, maybe at eye level in bookshops. Yeah, that's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the idea. So I mean, we're hoping that you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be in Waterstones. It will, more relevantly, it will be in airport books, bookstores. That's a perfect market for my books. Um, it'll be in Smith's. Um, also, the deal has, has international elements. So they're working with well-known, very well-known publishers, I mean, very, very well-known publishers in the US, Australia, South Africa. To get the books um, into into those stores as well, you know, and plus th there's the loads of benefits. It's easy to sell film rights with a with a. Um, unfortunately, this is and I I've had some success the other way around, but it is still easier to get a producer to take you more, more seriously if you have a more traditional way of getting the books out there. So we will have that, um, and plus, obviously, you know, as there'll be a, there'll be campaigns running when these books go live. That will mean I sell more digital books. Um, as people will, you know, find out about the Milton books and then maybe they'll go, you know what, there are 15 of these available. I don't want to wait until 2025. I'm going to buy a Kindle or, or a Kobo device and I'm going to read all of them um, right now. So everyone wins. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty cool deal. And, and hopefully this won't be the last time um, that we, we see this. I mean, obviously, if, if we can make a success of this, then there's more chance that that model will be, adapted but you know it's not hard to look around the community now and think of big selling indies who sell more than me um who this would be perfect for um you know the romance writers that, that kind of model with lots of content should be an absolute no-brainer um shane silver's writing his um kind of you know his urban fantasy the underlays of the world you know there, there's there's so many writers who could do this kind of thing so let's see i, I in, so, in some ways i suppose I'm, I'm the canary down the coal mine so you know if um <laughs> I'm still chirping um, by the end of next year. May maybe it's worked. <laughs> well, I am. Uh, I am really excited about this opportunity. Thanks for for sharing that and talking about it. Um, it's funny because, as as you mentioned, um, I have been waiting for a deal like this. And when I saw the announcement, I thought, okay, great, everyone's going to pick up on this. But but it hasn't yet. I don't think people understand the the depth of what this this actually means. Is in, in my mind as the next tipping point in our evolution, like one of them being the Kindle was a major tipping point for, for eBooks. And then of course, this to me is that wonderful tipping point where tradition, uh, all the smartness of traditional publishing combines with the smartness of indie publishing to make something much bigger than the sum of its parts. And I really am looking forward to where this takes us. So thank you for being a pioneer. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun, I and mean, it, it works the other way as well. So you may start to see the big traditionally published authors looking at the IP that they produce in terms of the, you know the assets that they can strip off. Say this, the new Stephen King book. He he probably not the kind of writer who do this, but someone of that stature could look 
and think, well, I've got lots of different IPs here. I don't need to sell them all to Random House. Yeah. Maybe the one I want to sell to Random House is the print, and I'll do everything else myself. Right. Almost certainly make more money that way. I mean, whether they want to actually do the work of doing that is a different question. But you, know, you could easily see mid-list authors now saying, that actually, why am I, why am I licensing everything? Um, yeah. There's a happy medium where everyone wins. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. It's one of those things I, I think is, has the potential to, te- you know, kind of take us up to a slightly different stage uh, along the journey that we, than, than, than where we've been so far. So it is exciting. <laughs> it is. And you've got so many exciting things on the horizon. I know that your 2020 conference, even though it's the you know, middle of the, the winter, uh, is already sold out um, so many months in advance. That's going to be an amazing opportunity. And I love that you're tying it in with London Book Fair. So a major rights fair for traditional combined with this powerful indie movement. <laughs> and I love the way that those are crossing over. Yeah, that was the, I, I picked that day deliberately. So it was uh, mostly because I knew that lots of writers would be in London at the time. All those writers who wanted to go have been thinking about going to the book fair. This might be the, the extra, you know, the sugar on the, you know, the cherry on top that persuades them to give that a go. Um, so yeah, that was, that was great. And uh, we sold out what, 920 seats in about two days, which was, um, ludicrous really flattering (laughs) it's amazing uh so one sort of last question because you have gone uh you know in the last eight years you have gone uh into a tremendous new career helping so many other writers there's probably people listening to this that that you know they they hear you say you know when you get that first 12 dollar check from amazon they go really i'm still waiting for my first 12 dollar check what sort of advice would you go back and give to that writer who's just starting off on that journey um, I saw actually someone posted in, our, in one of our groups today by expecting you know it to be easier than it is, and it isn't easy. If it was easy, we'd all be retired and and writing on Caribbean islands. Um, so it, it is hard work. I mean, fortunately, it's it's writing which is fun, and then I mean, like if I find the actual business side of it almost as much fun as the writing, which is is great. So you need you need to be prepared to do a little bit of slog. A, a slog. Um, the more content you have, the more money you stand to make through things like read through, you know, if you write, if you have a first book, then there's more books in the series. Then, um, you know, you could write a book about um, ghosts and then they have another book about ghosts and you can get a read through in, into those books. But, but kind of as a general, um, a general rule is to be professional, to work hard um, and to remember that you're, you're in competition on virtual bookshelves with not just indies like me, um, but also traditional houses, you know, the readers don't give two hoots as to who published the book from, for the most part, unless you give them a reason to notice that your product isn't as good as the Lee child book that you're competing with. So you want to make sure as much as possible that um, your covers stand out. It's, it's impeccably edited and, and it's the best thing that you can write. So um, yeah, don't expect it's not get rich quick. Uh, and those days, if they were ever here, have have long since gone. Um, but the good news is, we are still we are still very much in the vanguard here. And it's it's easy, you know, people who listen to this podcast, and people who listen to our podcast, and I mean, you know, in the same places that we go to, it's very easy to think that everyone knows what we know. A bit of an echo chamber. So you think, well, everyone knows what's possible with independent publishing. Most people have no idea. And and you know, my time is is spent quite a lot educating people um that you don't need an agent anymore or you don't need this isn't vanity publishing it couldn't be further from the truth um you can do it all yourself so we are kind of i i think we're still this is kind of almost day one um day one and a half maybe uh, of you know amazon always says it, it's day bezos's thing is it's day one on the internet i think it's kind of day one for independent publishing and that's that's very exciting there's there's loads and loads more scope to push this a, a lot further than we have already i love those uh those words because it's a reminder that we're still in the beginning we're in the pioneering days of of what's happening with digital publishing you're so right people think the kindle gold rush is over this whole new movement has just begun so that's a great reminder of that thank you yeah, no, it's exciting. So we, you know, say in the podcast, there's never been a better time to be a writer than that. It really, I really believe that it is. Um, it's never been easier to 
met, have a career as doing something creative that lots and lots of people would, you know, if you told me 15 years ago when I was a miserable lawyer that I would be sitting here being able to do a podcast, you know, in a house that I bought with the proceeds of selling the weird ideas in my head, I would have said, you are, you are off your trolley. Um, and, and that is exactly what's happened. So, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty, it's crazy, but amazing at times to be doing what we do. Well, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to share this amazing uh, journey with my listeners. Oh, it's a pleasure. Always.